quality public television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV. There is house debate over teaching middle school students about aspects of abortion. The governor's signature changes how state highway projects get the green light and giving the Cherokee credit for speaking their native language. Hello, I'm Kelly McCullum. Thanks for watching Legislative Week in Review. Let's begin our coverage this week in the House, where that chamber debated legislation to demand that middle school teachers discuss abortion in health class. The controversy covers whether an abortion increases a woman's risk of preterm birth during a future pregnancy. The words cause and the word risk made a real difference for pro-choice legislators. House Republicans approved new standards for middle school health education when it comes to what 12 and 13 year olds should know about abortions and a controversial link to future preterm births. There are thousands of preterm births in North Carolina every year. Um, it's, it um, adds to our infant mortality rate. Senate Bill 132 follows the advice of the state's Child Fatality Task Force. That task force recommended that teachers be required to teach that abortion is a cause of preterm birth later in a mother's life. But lawmakers have added additional language to include other causes of preterm birth, like poor prenatal care and drug use, among other reasons. The Child Fatality Task Force um, last December made a recommendation that this be added to the curriculum and at the time they were only focusing on abortion as the cause of as a cause of preterm birth and so that was their recommendation. House Democrats fought all week to replace the word cause in this legislation. They say multiple abortions are a possible risk factor but not a sure cause of future preterm births. Republicans fought the amendments to change the term then agreed to the switch late in House floor debate. In my opinion we're, we're trying to stigmatize uh, uh, abortion. Uh, it has already been said that there are many other things that may contribute uh, to preterm uh, births that are not even listed here. Whether it's a risk factor or a cause, according to this legislation, Democrats did not jump to support Bill 132 when that term was changed. Some pro-choice lawmakers say this bill is simply bad. Other opponents who have supported sex education bills in the past don't want middle schoolers learning about abortions, especially at 12 and 13 years old. I am a pretty progressive guy on a lot of things, but I would not want my 12-year-old daughter coming home having learned about abortions in school, what causes them, how you get them, what they look like. It occurred to many of us, and including the uh, members of the task force, that it would also be appropriate, maybe even more appropriate, to present this information when it is maybe even more useful, that is before uh, either a woman gets pregnant or a, male, a man tries to get a woman pregnant. So the bill, with its changes and with the debate over wording settled, returns to the Senate. The governor, DOT officials and legislative Republicans say they're quite surprised by the bipartisan support for changing the state's highway funding formula. The aim is removing political influence from determining where all that asphalt gets laid while ensuring that our roads and highways are built where they're needed more than where politicians want them. Governor Pat McCrory's signature will change the way North Carolina's highway construction projects are selected and funded in the future. It's the first funding formula adjustment in nearly 24 years. Businesses want to invest where states have their act together and where they have a strategy and a long-term vision. And that's exactly what we have done with the strategic mobility formula. It makes better use of existing funds to improve and expand our state's infrastructure. This is an important first step in addressing our infrastructure gap created by declining revenue and our increasing population. The new law is designed to remove political influence from the selection of highway projects with statewide impact. The law will allow political input and local recommendations for proposed road projects that affect regional areas with the greatest human influence being over what is built at the local or divisional level. Do the politics of road construction apply more when you're dealing with the urban areas and those politicians or the, or the rural areas without much population but powerful politicians? 
Uh, in old days, you're probably correct, but it's a new world out there today, and we did as much as we could to in the structure to get the politics out of it. Rural lawmakers have expressed concern in weeks past that transportation data, when analyzed, would show that most of the road construction needs are in urban North Carolina counties. It's a fact they worry would diminish their rural road funding. But the bill's main sponsors say they can understand the concern, but this law doesn't cheat any county. They say it ensures every area gets its fair share of highway funding. Local MPOs and RPOs still have input at the division and the regional level. The statewide level is going to be data driven and they've always got the oversight of the legislature. Legislative leaders say this funding formula change and the change of the selection process will make highway construction decisions easier to make, make them faster, and would effectively spend taxpayer money. It would also get asphalt laid more quickly. And there were some concerns in terms of balancing between the urban areas and the and the, uh, the rural areas, and we were worried about those potentially being flashpoints. But I think it's, it's a testament to the leadership of the members in the General Assembly who carried it through, but also the genius of this plan. This bill, uh, I believe, will uh, help uh, move North Carolina further into the 21st century uh, and help us move people and product uh, and improve commerce in our state. The law becomes technically active when lawmakers pass a budget bill that funds its provisions. State transportation officials are still finalizing the details of the new highway funding formula with a final release expected sometime in August 2013. Mecklenburg County Representative William Brawley has guided this bill that fundamentally, let's, let's just lay it out there, changes how we spend money on highways. Why did it need to change? Roads are getting paved out there. Bit by bit, the example I used was in 1989, my cell phone was a roll of quarters and a telephone calling card. I had a computer that ran MS-DOS and cost $4,000. If I wanted to send a text message, I wrote it out on a piece of paper and faxed it. Now I have a smartphone for $400, has a thousand times the storage. I make calls, I send and receive text, I can look at pictures. We have new ways of analyzing data new ways of planning roads. Why should we do it the same way we did in 1989? Because politics works, William Brawley, and I always thought you had a powerful senator. That's why you climbed the ranks here. So when you pointed your finger at budget time, you got a bridge built. You know that's the way it's worked down here for 100 years. It's worked years. that way for years. And what we have are counties that have a great four-lane road that crosses the district line and becomes a two-lane road. Look at Highway 49 between Ashboro and Charlotte. Four lanes, two lanes, four lanes, two lanes. One good four-lane road from Ashboro to Charlotte would cut travel time for manufacturers for distribution to a major center and create more economic growth in Randolph County. People in Anson County are losing population, very high unemployment. They are close enough to the Charlotte market that if they had a good road, they could work and stay in the home place. As it is, they have to sell the family farm, move to Mecklenburg or Guilford County, or wake to get a job. What we're trying to do is connect the state together by spending our roads in a way that is smart for the people, not smart for the politicians. Let's ask you about this formula that's coming out, a, mm -hmm. a road of statewide interest. Would that Highway 49 stretch going over that many county, would that be a statewide interest? Well, I, it could be, or it would pro probably be a regional, but it would okay. be more data driven. But an example of the kind of roads Give me that a, would. Statewide, yeah, like Interstate Highway. Interst Interstate 26 in Western North Carolina would open up the whole western part of the state by connecting into uh, Interstate 81 in Virginia. Right, right. Would also uh, give you an alternate route around I 40, which is frequently blocked by landslides. Mm -hmm. uh, roads from the northeast corner of North Carolina into Hampton mm -hmm. Roads would allow us to use Norfolk the same way Fort Mill, South Carolina uses Charlotte. Okay, DOT would will generate this data or whatever, the mm -hmm. scientific stuff. They plug this into a computer. No matter that you serve, may serve an area served by an interstate, the computer will tell this state how it will spend highway money to build a highway in Charlotte first versus into Hampton Roads, into Asheville. That's what I don't understand. The big computer will spit out, and then what do we get? Oh, no, this isn't our electronic overlords. When we talk about data-driven, mm -hmm. we're not talking about a computer program. What we are talking about is analyzing economic uh, travel time impacts, what are the potential. A lot of this is going to require human beings to examine it. What they'll be looking at is what road best serves the state, not 
who gets reelected. Humans take a scientific approach. There's no computer going to be built at DOT because you That's hear about the, you hear about this computer formula and these funding formulas. No, we're not doing that. On that local level, you still give local leaders a, a chance to say, "I'd like 50% this." Fifty percent of the input. And for mm -hmm. rural counties, it got a disproportionate amount of funding, according to lawmakers' opinion. This 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 makes everything fair, in your opinion. We're not taking money away from rural areas. Mm -hmm. What we are doing is connecting rural areas to urban areas in a way that benefits everybody. So you can live in the country and drive in the city without it taking half the day, rush hour, and the like. Absolutely. Quick movement, people, goods, transportation that benefits everybody in the state, not just the politically powerful. And it's the law now. Representative William Brawley, Mecklenburg County, thank you for being on the show, sir. You're welcome, sir. Always enjoy watching it and glad to be on. Appreciate that. The Senate Education Committee discussed charter school enrollment policy and how to handle a situation when one family member gets into a school and leaving other kids behind. House Bill 250 would give siblings, step-siblings, and foster children priority enrollment status if one other child in the family wins a charter school assignment. The legislation would also carry benefits for charter school employees some Democrats, but they can't stop the bill, call the whole idea unfair. We're allowing charter schools to give enrollment priority to the children of all full-time employees, but these children cannot exceed 10% of the school's enrollment. What we're doing is we're just giving an advantage to somebody because they got lucky once, and it just doesn't seem right to me. The bill's scheduled vote has been postponed in the Senate as of this week. The Senate has also postponed voting on new penalties for drivers who pass a stop school bus. House Bill 428 would require all drivers be fined for passing a stop bus, even on first offenses. Repeat offenders would pay thousands of dollars in fines, lose their driver's licenses for years, if not permanently. Commercial drivers who lose their personal driver's licenses for passing up school bus would lose their CDLs as well. School systems would receive the fine revenue. They'd be encouraged to buy bus camera technology to increase safety. K-12 students of the Cherokee Nation take Cherokee language lessons in their schools. Some Cherokee middle schoolers asked lawmakers for help a couple of years ago for the time when they go to college. They want credit for fluently speaking a native yet so-called foreign language should they attend a UNC system campus. Davie uh, County uh, Senator Andrew uh, Brock has been working uh, to help students of the Cherokee Nation be recognized for learning their native language. The university system doesn't have a universal policy for recognizing Cherokee, so students may study their native language for years and have it not count towards a degree. This idea for getting uh, credit came from students uh, in middle school from Cherokee who were in this program and saw the value of getting of having this in college. Senator Brock says current university policies require Cherokee students to set aside all those years of study to pick up another foreign language simply for credit purposes. Instead of uh, stop taking the classes in 11th and 12th grade to take another foreign language like Spanish or French, could finish up uh, taking classes in Cherokee and have that uh, if they pass the placement exam have that as their, quote, foreign language credit. It's estimated that about 22,000 people worldwide can speak the Cherokee language. And if one focuses on the Cherokee Reservation in North Carolina, the numbers are much less. And I've just under 15,000 members of the Eastern Band of Cherokee. We just have a few hundred that are fluent. If this bill can earn final approval in the governor's signature, every UNC system campus would recognize Cherokee as a foreign language and give Cherokee students credit for speaking it fluently. That recognition would begin in the fall 2013 academic semester. House legislation to give special needs students public scholarships to cover education expenses received financial scrutiny in the Senate this week. Students with individualized education plans would qualify for up to $6,000 in public scholarships every school year. Tax-paying families currently can receive this credit, but poor families don't receive these credits because they don't pay taxes. This bill would allow them to access those funds. But some Senate Republican leaders worry this program, while sounding good, could become a growing entitlement program. So what it really does is extend this opportunity 
to, to the poorest citizens, if you will, those that don't necessarily pay that amount of money in, in taxes would still be, uh, be able to receive the scholarship grant. I think what you'll find is once a family gets on, you're not going to get them off. I think they're going to love the program. So expanding the program, I think, will be a true problem as it becomes a budget item. And I, I think that's the issue I'm trying to get my arms around. The Senate Education Committee approves legislation called Brass to Class. It would streamline the process for veterans who leave the military and become public educators. Veterans could receive one year of state working experience for every full year of military service if they held a bachelor's degree in the military. They could receive one state service year for every two years of military service should they not hold a bachelor's degree. There would be other benefits if the full Senate approves. It provides some t student teaching stipends for, for um, members of the armed forces to, uh, to be able to enter into a new career for teaching, and it reduces the licensure requirements for military veterans who are pursuing a teacher or school administrator license. The House voted this week to overhaul North Carolina's state economic development efforts. The State Department of Commerce would contract with a brand new nonprofit corporation. That corporation would handle economic development projects and cut out some regional economic authorities. Prosperity zones would be created that would help struggling counties recruit industry and jobs. Republicans say this plan is the future. Democrats say the plan concentrates economic development leadership in Raleigh, just like the good old days. Um, things needed to change in commerce. Things were we, uh, Commerce has not been reaching out to our rural areas and to our the variety of uh, jobs that are needed in a specific way in our in our areas. Our biggest trouble in Western North Carolina is getting any attention out of Raleigh to the special needs of our region. And our regional partnerships have done a very good job in developing our assets for opportunities and innovation and everything. The Senate Finance Committee easily passed a bill that would end the North Carolina political party's financing fund. That fund is backed by that checkbox you'll find on your state income tax return. So when you file, you can check the box and a donation is given to the political party you choose. It is public money supporting political parties, and that has conservatives this session moving to stop it. By doing so, we prevent the diversion of what would normally be revenue to the general fund from going to political parties, one of three political parties, Democrat, Republican, or Libertarian, and we put it back in the general fund where it belongs. It's a $2 million gain for the general Thank fund. State government will operate under a continuing resolution beginning July 1st. Government funding will run at 95% of its 2012-2013 budget levels until lawmakers can pass a compromise budget bill. Medicaid will receive additional money under this resolution as budget negotiators discuss deals on an income tax overhaul and a new budget year deal for the years 2013 and 2014. Barry Smith is the associate editor of the Carolina Journal. Joining us to talk about continuing resolutions, tax reform, budget, all goes hand in hand. We've got to get the state government uh, ready for 2013, Barry. That's right. Fiscal year starts on uh, July the 1st, which isn't far away. Uh, we won't have a budget ready. Not that unusual. Uh, we had the, the uh, difference, the, the one thing that sticks out was actually two years ago when it was ready on time. When you look at... Republicans running this state now, they have run it for the past, what, three years, and you've got Democrats who ran it forever before that, pretty much. Uh, any differences in the tactics and the strategy and in the schedules? More things change, more things stay the same. You could probably look at it that way. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of differences in philosophies a, as opposed to before, uh, but, you know, we have this system of checks and balances, and that's what we see working. It's not necessarily pretty, and it doesn't necessarily mean that the trains are going to run on time but uh, that's, that's the way our system works. We have two bills out there that are big, the budget bill and mm -hmm. then the Senate, Senate's version of tax reform, right. the House, and they're, they're working this behind closed doors. Anything we say is, is, is just subjective, so I don't know what's gonna pop out. Well, yeah, I, I don't know that anyone really knows what's gonna pop out either. The thing is, the budget is dependent on that tax bill, particularly if the tax bill is not revenue neutral, which again, you know, we'd heard a lot up until uh, the last few months that we want to make this thing revenue neutral, which means you know, that whatever new tax plan we come out with 
it's going to be bringing the same amount of money or approximately the same amount of money as before, so it's not a tax increase. Well, guess what? The Republicans decided they wanted to make a tax decrease in their uh, tax reform plan, and uh, so now they're trying to work out those details. Got to know, got to know about that before we know what's in the budget. The devil is in the details on tax reform, no doubt about it. However, you still got a procedural vote in the Senate, technically a third vote, mm -hmm. final vote on their bill, but it seems they're working out differences before going that route so that every vote will be final going forward. It appears that way, Barry. Right. Is, that, is that the sense? Is that that's, the correct sense? That, that's the way it's looking, and my understanding is that uh, they are heavily negotiating that. Uh, it, at one time, we were thinking that Maybe they were going to drop that. I think there's too much for them to lose politically if they, they do not work out a tax reform package. Now, do they, ha do they hold hands and jump at the last second? Because when this bill comes out, it could be a couple of votes to make this thing law. And uh, the bill is crafted over months, and now you're going to have days to pass it. Will special interests, citizens, everybody who cares about tax reform be howling at the end of this process no matter what? Well, anybody who is going to, uh, who is not going to be reflected positively is going to be howling. That, again, that's the nature of the beast. Uh, that's one of the things that, interestingly enough, Senator Bob Rucho, uh, when he was first introducing his more, um, you know, more expansive tax reform a few weeks ago, he actually got the um, lobbyists in, in the committee room to actually raise their hands and say, hey, these are the people who are going to be fighting against it. So anyone who doesn't, uh, who's going to be taxed more than they were before, they're not going to be happy. What's the big deal? Because if tax reform doesn't pass in 2013, the bill can be carried over to 2014 and lots of legislation takes two years to implement fully. Well, or pass it, pass it in total. I, I, think, I think that the Republicans have built this up. They've actually said, we're going to do that. We're going to do this, and we're going to do it this year. Governor McCrory said his, in his State of the State address to a joint session of the General Assembly back in February, we are going to do tax reform this year. That's one of the big uh, pieces of meat in the whole uh, process, in his whole plan. If it's not done, it's not going to be a victory. It's going to be a defeat. For Barry Smith, Carolina Journal. Thank you, sir. Thank you. The Senate is moving House legislation to limit lawsuits against food manufacturers. Bill sponsors say people should be responsible for their personal dietary choices. This proposal would prevent these sick people from suing the food companies because their food choices gave them chronic illnesses. The bill also aims to prevent what happened in New York City with colas. And the second portion of the bill um, keeps local municipalities from being able to restrict soft drink sizes. Um, so very straightforward bill, very common sense bill. Legislation to allow tobacco farmers to promote tobacco was briefly threatened by a last minute addition to a bill this week. Tobacco promotion is a non-controversial issue here, but giving a new state agency the power to enforce the state's public smoking ban did catch lawmakers' attention. This bill basically will allow the tobacco growers to have an assessment so they can use it in ways that the Tobacco Grower Association will determine with their full support. Most and members uh, of the Senate uh, Agricultural uh, Committee uh, received uh, House Bill 816 bill this week thinking it would allow the Tobacco okay Growers Association to spend its own money on promotion. But this week's bill contained a new provision. State health officials would see the responsibility for enforcing the state's public smoking ban given to the Department of Environment and Natural Resources, or DENER. This basically is going to clarify the language across the state on what is allocated as no smoking zones in bars and restaurants, because currently there seems to be a lot of confusion as to what some areas are doing and what some owners and are doing. The focus on the smoking ban enforcement shift revealed some skepticism among committee members. Orange County Senator Ellie Kinnear joined Democratic colleagues to say the current smoking ban policy is working, both for businesses and for bureaucrats. The Restaurant Association sent a letter to each of us saying how important this was to keep these rules in place, that their businesses had, it, had actually expanded once that was put in place. Yeah. To my knowledge, this does nothing more than clarify and sort of make uniform rules of, that would affect all the way across this state and not each county or each local health director making different rules. They will still enforce them, but they will be uniform across the state. Assistant Secretary of the Department of Environment and Natural Resources and former Republican Representative Mitch Gillespie was asked how Diener would handle smoking ban enforcement. This might would have made a little bit of sense to us prior to us moving a lot of the uh, different 
responsibilities we had over to DHHS a few years ago, but right now we don't see how in the world we'd have anybody at all that would be capable of uh, and, and the expertise in doing this, and, and we would oppose this. Following that feedback, the smoking ban change was quickly removed so the entire tobacco growers bill might survive. Tobacco growers must approve this assessment if it's allowed, which could be valued at up to 15 cents for every 100 pounds of tobacco marketed in North Carolina. Davidson County Republican Representative Jerry Dockham is leaving the North Carolina House after 22 years in office. He'll take his public service credentials to the State Utilities Commission while he'll serve as a commissioner. It's a move considered a promotion by many of his House colleagues. Here's how to find us this week online. Our Facebook page is facebook.com slash legweek. If you follow us on Twitter or on Twitter, follow us at legweek in review and send your comments directly to our team via email. The email address is legweek at unctv.org. That's our show for this week. Thank you so much for watching. Quality Public Television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV.